So hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today on building confidence and managing anxiety in your child. And this is a part one of a, of a two part webinar series, which is targeted towards parents of children who are under the age of 12. My name's Ellis Blythe. I'm an assistant psychologist with the psychology and schools team. And joining me today is Gemma. Gemma, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Gemma Dutton and I'm a senior children's wellbeing practitioner in the Wellbeing Under 18s team. Um, so I'll be joining Ellis presenting some of the content of this webinar and I'll join you guys in a bit. Amazing, thank you very much. Um, so this uh, webinar series is being delivered by the Under 18s Wellbeing team as part of Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and the content we're using today was uh, also developed by Islington Cowns, which is part of Whittington Health NHS Trust as well. So hopefully today, um, you would have joined us after viewing the psychology in schools team uh, anxiety workshop or the managing big feelings uh, workshop that, that we've delivered. Um, this content will try and build on what was covered in those workshops. So hopefully you'll have a bit of a springboard to build from. So just to get started, it'd be helpful for us to sort of just see how your day has been today. We use a interaction tool called Slido, which is completely free. You can access it by going to slido.com and then putting in the code uh, that you can see on the screen in the search bar, which is 125605. Um, so if you can just log into Slido for us, this is how we're going to engage and interact with you today. Uh, we don't use the Q&A in Zoom. Um, and instead, we, we like to use Slido to, to get your feedback to certain questions. So just let us know sort of how you're, how you're doing today. Lovely, so we're getting, getting some answers already. And what I will say is, uh, if you can just try and avoid putting in any confidential information or any information that might identify you or your, or your child, um, while the responses are anonymous, anything you put in will be visible to um, everyone else that's joining us today. Okay, lovely. So sort of a bit of a mix. Uh, maybe the majority are doing quite well today, but a couple of people maybe, um, on the lower end of the scale. So hopefully this workshop will uh, might help to, to alleviate any, any worries that you might have and hopefully pick up your day a little bit. Okay, so what are you hoping to achieve from this course? What, what are your goals? What brings you here today? Uh, what can we try to help you with? So again, with Slido, you can type in your answer, send it through. Everybody else can see what you've put, which can be helpful. Um, Excellent, so we've got one answer already. So to learn how to support my child, which is great. And hopefully um, hopefully we'll be able to, to give you some, some information, some advice and some strategies over the, the two parts of this webinar to really help you to be able to feel more confident uh, in, in able to do that. So ideas to help my child and, and not to feel so anxious. Yeah, so when our young people, when our children feel anxious that can lead to us very anxious we don't like to see our children in distress um, and especially if sometimes we we don't know the best way of helping that can make us a bit worried uh, so hopefully um, this workshop will help you to give help to give you some confidence in being able to help support your child with their worry um, and that will hopefully help you with your worry as well so being able to help my child manage her anxiety and to, to understand it as well yeah so being able to understand some of that anxiety is sort of the a good first step in being able to support support our children. And I want to know how I can help my daughter when she's worried. Excellent. So hopefully, um, hopefully you'll have achieved your goals by the end of this two part course. Um, and on the screen at the moment, you'll just see some aims that that we're hoping to to cover um, throughout the two parts. So the first one really is just to be able to understand anxiety in children, what it looks like. Um, what different factors might lead to the development of worry in, in our children. Um, and we're going to go through sort of some different ideas to try and help you build that understanding. We're also going to briefly outline a few strategies for managing anxiety and, and building confidence in your child. Um, but in part two, this is where we're going to cover more of the strategies. So we're going to think about things that you can do as a parent to help uh, your child to, to manage their worry and to help them to build some confidence as well. Okay, so like I said earlier, um, with confidentiality, with Slido, 
please just be mindful that any responses you give will be visible to everyone here. Um, so please just don't share any personal details or confidential information that might identify you. Um, we're going to try and take the Slido answers and, and try and respond to general themes rather than specific questions. Um, so we'll use Slido as we go through rather than things like the Zoom Q&A or things like that. Okay, so like I said before, hopefully you've come here after attending the, the Psychology and Schools Team Anxiety Workshop or the Managing Big Feelings Workshop that the Psychology and Schools Team have also delivered. And really within those two workshops, we cover something called the Brain House. And it's something that we think is a really helpful analogy for understanding how anxiety sort of works within the brain. And it's a really useful thing to sort of hang the hat on for some of the learning we're going to cover over the next two parts. So we thought it'd be really helpful just to do a little bit of a recap as to what the brain house was all about. So the brain house sort of thinks about the brain as being a house, as the name would suggest, and the house has two floors. So we've got an upstairs part of the brain and a downstairs part of the brain. The upstairs part of the brain um, represents the prefrontal cortex, which is the bit of the brain that's just behind our forehead. Uh, this part of the brain deals with some of the higher level thinking, so our ability to plan, um, rational and logical thinking um, and sort of all those higher level thinking skills. If you look at the picture of the house on the left you'll see there's a staircase which connects the upstairs and the downstairs part of the brain um, and if we move down that staircase towards the downstairs that area represents our limbic system which has parts of the brain such as the amygdala in um, and this part of the brain is really quite emotion focused and it's quite focused on survival as well. So it tries to keep us safe. Um, it links in with the fight, flight and freeze response quite nicely as well. So we might say that the upstairs part of the brain has all of our thinkers in, so like logical Logan or people like that. And the downstairs part of the brain has all the feelers in, all those emotions. So you might have people like Alarm Bell Allen, for instance, that rings the bell when they sense danger. And if we sort of perceive some danger, um, the downstairs part of the brain starts responding to try and keep us safe. So it might start to pump lots of adrenaline around our body, get our breathing and heart rate quicker to get us ready to fight off a threat or to run away from it. Um, but when the brain, when the brain house is sort of all intact, like in the left hand side of the picture, uh, the thinkers can come down the stairs and say to the feelers, you know what, we don't need to be so worried about this. Um, maybe it's a dog that we have a lot of contact with and we know is friendly. We might see that it's got teeth and, and claws and it's going to run quite quickly. Um, Alarm by Alan might start ringing the bell when he sees those parts of the dog. But then Logical Logan can come downstairs and say, oh, hang on a minute, Alan, let's just calm down a bit. Um, we've seen this dog before, it's very friendly. You know, we interact with it all the time. And that helps to calm down that, that anxiety response. Sometimes uh, our distress and our anxiety can get so much that we do something called flipping our lid, which if you look on the right hand side of the picture, the upstairs part of the brain sort of flies off from the downstairs part. Now, this doesn't happen physically in the body or your brain is completely intact, um, but it does mean that the thinkers can't communicate with the feelers downstairs. So what happens is emotions start driving our behavior. We start getting really quite survival focused um, and we respond in this fight, flight or freeze. So we're going to use the brain house, like I said, to sort of hang the hat on uh, for the learning that we're going to be doing today. And we'll sort of try and refer back to it as we go through. So I'm going to hand you over to Gemma, who's going to take over for the next part. Thanks, Alice. OK, so I just want to start to think about how, as parents, you might be seeing anxiety in your child. It can be helpful to kind of break anxiety down and to think about some of the thoughts your child might be having, maybe particular worries or anxious kind of thinking that they might be doing. Or you might be thinking about how they show you that they're feeling anxious, maybe in their behaviour, maybe some of the things they do or some of the things that they don't want to do because they're feeling anxious about it. And also, it's really important to think about how anxiety affects our bodies. Um, Ellis mentioned the kind of the fight, flight, freeze response that's going on in our body and, and when we're flipping our lid kind of being flooded with that adrenaline so maybe you're noticing some kind of physical symptoms that your child might be showing you when they are feeling anxious so we're going to go on to explain how all of these elements come together and also how we can kind of make sense of them but firstly I just want to ask you guys in the next slido 
what you notice when your child is anxious. So are you noticing lots of anxious thinking or is it more lots of behaviours or, or avoiding certain things? Or maybe your child is someone who really physically feels that anxiety in their body. Yeah, we've got lots of physical symptoms um, coming up on the Slido. So it could be lots of things like headaches or tummy aches, things like that. Or we could get lots of anxious behaviours, things like um, you know, not wanting to do certain things or wanting to do them only with other people or with parents. Interestingly, we've got less people saying anxious thinking. And I wonder if that's because that's the one we can't see. Um, and sometimes anxiety, we use that kind of iceberg analogy of, you know, what we might see is the tip of the iceberg is the behaviours or maybe the physical symptoms. But underneath that, under the surface, there could be lots of anxious thoughts or worries happening. But it sounds like you guys have noticed lots of different, you're picking up on lots of different cues when your child is anxious, which is fantastic. So I'm going to move on now to kind of answer some of the questions that some of you said you wanted answered in this webinar, which is to understand what is anxiety. And it can be really confusing because of these different elements. So let's just kind of break it down, really. So it's really important to start by saying that anxiety is a normal emotion. And we all have the propensity or the ability to feel anxious. And um, so there's nothing wrong with us if we do feel anxious. It's part of our normal human range of emotions. And in the right amount, it can be really useful. So I'm sure we've all experienced times where we felt a bit anxious and actually it's helped us to kind of perform a bit better because it, we're kind of tuned in to what that feeling is telling us. Um, and one way of thinking about anxiety is to kind of break it down into three characteristics, which we've already started to do. So we've thought about the kind of physical feelings we might get, things like maybe headaches, tummy aches, feeling sick, maybe feeling a bit shaky, um, maybe uh, getting a bit sweaty, sweaty palms. Um, and, and things like that are the kind of physical sensations which come from the fight flight response, from your body noticing a kind of threat and then preparing the body to act on it. So sending lots of blood into your legs and your arms and away from your tummy, maybe causing your child to feel a bit sick or, or maybe feeling a bit kind of, yeah, a bit nauseous. So those, there are lots of physical symptoms um, which come as a result of the kind of increased arousal we can feel when we feel anxious and that kind of flood of adrenaline we get through our body. We can also experience lots of anxious thinking, anxious thoughts, and these can come in lots of different forms. So it might be lots of thinking of the worst case scenario. So kind of catastrophizing, there's a lot like fancy word for it, but basically just thinking of the worst thing that could happen. And your brain is kind of doing that to kind of, to kind of assess the danger of a situation, how worried you should be. But often when we're really anxious, we overestimate how dangerous the situation might be. And lot, something that's really common um, in younger children and adults as well is lots of worry. So we might get lots of what if kind of thoughts, you know, what if this happens or what if that happens or, you know, and we can get into lots of like worry situations. And, and I think that's really normal. We all have worries, but when someone's feeling really anxious, they might have lots of worries or lots of repetitive worries. And as we said on the other slide, you know, there can be lots of anxious behaviors. So sometimes I break this down and think about things that we do because we feel really anxious. So maybe soothing behaviors, maybe sit, and sometimes we call them safety behaviors, doing things with another person, never doing them on our own, or um, always seeking lots of maybe reassurance. Um, but also we might think about things that we don't do. So things that we avoid doing because we feel anxious. Um, avoidance is a really natural response to feeling anxious. So sometimes as a parent, you might notice your child not wanting to do something. And maybe that, that might be because they're feeling quite worried about doing that. And the point of all of this, I guess, is that these thoughts and feelings and behaviours, it's our brain's best intention to try and keep us safe, to try and avoid danger. But sometimes our, we're a bit too overly cautious. And so that's when we kind of get a, a perfect storm of like feeling anxious, the thoughts, the behaviours all coming together, feeling maybe overly worried about things. And, and then we start to avoid things or get lots of those physical symptoms. So I guess the point to take away from the slide as well is that some people might present with maybe the physical feelings, some people the thoughts, some the behaviours, but it's a combination of, of, of all of those things together that kind of join together to, to lead to anxiety or feeling anxious. So I'm going to move on now to think a bit about 
how do fears and worries develop in children? I think one of the worries I often hear from parents is, you know, where does anxiety come from or what caused it or, or was it something I did or someone else did? And I think that's such a natural question parents have because of course we want to understand where this anxiety has come from so we can kind of preserve, prevent it or do something about it. And I think with anxiety, it's really important to acknowledge that there's such a mixture of factors that um, can cause someone to feel anxious and some of them we can control and some of them we can't. So as parents, it's really important not to, not to blame ourselves um, that we didn't, couldn't prevent anxiety because actually, as you see on the slide, there's so many things that can contribute to someone feeling anxious. So I'll just talk through each of them. The first one is thinking about your genes or your temperament. We've all got different genetic kind of predispositions. There isn't a particular worry gene or anxious gene, but sometimes there are different personality factors that people kind of have innately that can mean that they may be more likely to feel anxious or worried. Um, there's different life events that can occur as well. Sadly, things like bereavements or parents separating or unexpected uh, things happening can cause someone to feel a bit anxious, understandably. Um, there's learning by kind of watching other people. So kind of, you know, seeing how someone else responds, maybe they're quite avoidant of certain situations and you just naturally as a child pick up on the same kind of, same kind of response. And there's also slightly differently learning from other people's reactions. So they're similar, but a bit different. So if someone, uh, you know, if I was kind of out with my child walking and I, I saw a dog and I, you know, suddenly panicked and crossed the road and, and, and walked away really quickly, I might not have said anything, but my child might learn from my reaction, oh, that's, that seems dangerous uh, and kind of make that association. So children all the time are kind of picking up on our cues of how we're responding and dealing to everyday situations in life. So sometimes, learning from reactions as well. And coping experiences, you know, we all learn how to cope throughout our life. These are skills that we're developing as we come across different situations. So there's also something about how we learn to cope in situations, but also how we feel affected by times where maybe we didn't cope or manage to cope as well as we would have wanted to. And that can kind of cause someone to feel a bit anxious about how they might cope in a similar situation in the future. I think, it's really important to just come back to that point we started with and to acknowledge that, you know, there are lots of different factors that cause anxiety and we can't control all of them. In fact, more often than not, they're things that we can't control or choose to have happened or not happen. Um, and, and sometimes it's about thinking about how we might want to respond in the future or respond differently, but lots of factors can contribute to anxiety. I want to kind of, move on now just to kind of talk about some research as well that sometimes I think can be really helpful for parents and that's just to kind of think about the developmental processes that children are going through and the normal developmental kind of worries that accompany different stages and this is not an exact science you can experience these worries at all different times in your life but generally there are some worries that are really normally attributed to the kind of development of the brain so at six months, not to six months, we can, you know, we're really sensitive to the sensory stimuli that we are experiencing. As babies, we're experiencing everything through our senses around us. But then, you know, as we develop, we, we develop different sort of anxieties as we go through those stages. So from six to 12 months, we can, it's really normal to experience that kind of separation anxiety from our caregivers because we're naturally becoming maybe a bit more independent, maybe we're crawling, we're, we're exploring the world separate from our parents for maybe the first time. Uh, and two to four years, we've got things like imaginary creatures, uh, burglars, the dark, and that's because our imagination and our brain is kind of developing and we're able as young children to start distinguishing between fantasy and reality. So suddenly that brings new possibilities the brain is trying to think about and understand. Between years sort of five to seven, we develop, we start developing, and, and this takes many years to develop all the way up to sort of our mid twenties, our kind of operational thinking and our logical thinking. That means that sometimes things that we might hear about kind of in the news like natural disaster or illness or injury, death, they can become a bit more frightening because we're thinking in quite black and white terms and those can be quite nuanced situations. So they can be kind of alarming to children or cause some worries. Um, 
between eight and 11, we start to see some kind of development of our, our children's self-esteem um, and, and their self-confidence, but also they're at school and they start to maybe comparing themselves to others or being more aware of their peers as they're developing their sense of themselves amongst other people. So there can be some worries around kind of comparing to others. And then from kind of 12 to 18 years, we start thinking about, um, again, our more social development as a person. So we get lots more kind of um, maybe social worries, worried about how we get along with other people, how we develop those relationships and how we develop our self-esteem. So I guess the point of this research and just talking through this table is to kind of demonstrate that it is really normal and age appropriate as we develop to have different kinds of worries that will take on different levels of significance. So if you're seeing lots of a particular kind of worry, sometimes it can be worth to think, is it is this part of my child's development and a process that they're going through at the moment? There's still strategies you can use to help, but sometimes it can help to understand where that worry might be coming from. I just wanted to kind of add a note to, um, we mentioned in the years five to seven, there can be lots of normal worries around death and kind of mortality, which can be really challenging for parents to manage and frightening for young ch children to experience. So there are kind of lots of resources that it can be really helpful to look at. Um, things like different books, like Michael Ronson's The Sad Book or um, Judith Kerr's Goodbye Mog. And, uh, and, and there's lots of resources online specific um, to the worry about death, but as parents, it can be really helpful to think about how you wanna have some of those conversations. Um, but we will also send out some resources at the end that will kind of link in with that, but I just wanted to mention it now. So I want to move on now to think about when anxiety kind of becomes a problem. And I'm gonna kind of use air quotes as a problem because like we said, anxiety is a really normal um, emotional experience that can be really appropriate depending on what's happening in our environment and what's happening in our relationships. So just because we feel anxious, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem or something particularly wrong. It might be a really normal response to what's happening in our lives or, or in our um, environment around us. I think one thing that is helpful to think about is, is the anxiety your, your child is experiencing, is it kind of stopping them from doing things that they want to or need to do in their lives? Is it kind of tipping from that helpful level of anxiety that kind of keeps you safe and nudges you towards doing things you need to do? Or has it kind of tipped over in the balance and actually your child's feeling so anxious that they're unable to do things that they maybe want to or need to do? And, and is it becoming really hard for you as a parent to kind of manage that anxiety? And is that where it's coming a bit more problematic? Often when I think about how to work out if anxiety is becoming problematic for someone, I think about different areas of their life that might be affecting. So you might think about, you know, is it affecting your child socially? Is it stopping them from going out or mixing with friends or making new friends? Is it affecting them academically? Is it making them really hard to get for them to get into school? Or is it making it really hard for them to kind of concentrate in school because they've got so many worries that they can't kind of tune in and think about what's actually happening in the classroom? Or maybe you're noticing it's really affecting their mood and actually they're feeling quite low because they maybe feel like they're missing out on doing certain things because they feel too anxious to do them. Or they're just feeling kind of worn down by, by feeling anxious all the time. It's a really kind of can be draining emotional state. So those are some things to maybe look out for. And also I think, you know, as a parent, is it really affecting you? Is it becoming hard to manage or are you feeling particularly concerned or worried and maybe you know that's letting you know that that anxiety is kind of tipped from that balance of being kind of normal like a normal response that's helpful to a kind of unhelpful response sometimes i give a bit of an example here because i think it, it can be really hard to figure out when anxiety has become more difficult to manage so i think about maybe your child's first day of school and it would be so normal and natural for them to feel really nervous on the first day of school, maybe the first week of school, maybe even the first kind of month or half term of school, you know, especially if they're a new class, a new teacher, or maybe it's their first time going to school. So that anxiety would be really normal. But then maybe if they started to feel really anxious going to school every single day, or they couldn't get into school, or they couldn't do, you know, have to keep leaving certain lessons, maybe that's when we'd see that anxiety has gone from 
being kind of a normal response to something that's going on in their lives to feeling maybe more unhelpful because it's stopping them doing something that they need to do. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the slider now because I've done lots of talking. So I want you guys to just have an opportunity to think now about what does anxiety stop your child from enjoying? Is there anything that you've noticed they're holding back from doing or feeling unable to do because maybe they're feeling uh, really anxious? So I'll just give you a moment to, to pop some comments in the slider. And I think it's important, I guess, to distinguish, you know, are they really anxious or maybe it's something they don't want to do. I know that can be difficult as well to distinguish. Someone's saying going to school, and I think that's a really noticeable one, isn't it? And a really challenging one for parents as well, because you, you really want to get them into school and you don't want them to miss out on, on their education. Someone's saying going to bed is a really real struggle. Um, and yeah, bedtime can be really hard. Often your child's distracted all day, but then they get to bed and maybe they're feeling quite worried or they're trying to process the school day. So, so anxiety can kind of hit them then. We've got family get togethers, there's sort of social things, like we said, looking at the social um, impact on your child's life. Your child worries about doing their homework and getting it wrong. Yeah, that can be really common as well. Worried about maybe making mistakes or asking for help or, or maybe that social comparison coming in there worried about being worse or, than other people um spending time with friends sleepovers and parties <clears throat> yeah i think sleepovers i hear so many times when i work with young people and parents because often it's the first sort of experience of of kind of separating it's, and it's also a bit social and um, often it comes up around year six age where people have their first residential trip with the school so that can be a, a really common worry. Um, and there can be lots of different reasons or worries behind that as well. Someone saying meal times, uh, which is interesting. So maybe it's, you know, they're feeling quite anxious or maybe it's because they're feeling those physical symptoms of anxiety, feeling quite sick and it, it makes them lose their appetite. Um, and someone saying new things, sports clubs. And I think new things, I'm really grateful to that person that said that because often it's something new or uncertain or unknown where our brain doesn't quite know how to make sense of that, that risk or how, how dangerous or safe this is gonna be if I don't know if I've never done it before. And that's when our anxiety can kind of kick in and make us overestimate you know, how that might be. So um, yeah, great comments. And I, it sounds like you guys are really observing some, some things where anxiety might be impacting the young person. I just want to kind of come onto something now, thinking about the context and I think underlying all of this, we've talked about anxiety kind of, you know, being our, our body and our brain's response to making sense and understanding threats in our environment. And for children to kind of thrive, they need to feel that the world is a pretty safe place. And I mean, I think it's interesting to say that given kind of, you know, some of the things we've gone through in the world over the last few years. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can say to children, the world is a totally safe place and everything's always fine, because as adults, we know, that's not realistic, that it's unpredictable. Um, but it, children can be really impacted by their sense of what's going on around them in the world. So, you know, I think recently COVID is just, you know, an immediate example of, of how wider things in the environment, children can pick up on that. And then, you know, it causes disruption to their routine or they, they feel suddenly the world isn't a safe place. And that can really naturally shake children and adults' confidence. Um, and I think another example that I hear all the time actually from young people is feeling really worried about climate change and the environment um, and things like that. I think it's really important that, you know, we don't avoid discussing these difficult topics, but we can kind of think about how we want to have that conversation with our, with our children to help them understand that we validate and acknowledge their worries, that they are genuine and that they do have concerns, but we also help them to kind of make sense of those worries in a way that's kind of age appropriate so that they can understand and make sense of that in a way that feels right for them, rather than kind of feeling really flooded or overwhelmed by the sense that the world is a really unsafe place. Often it's a really difficult conversation for parents because you're, you know, as an adult, you're holding all those factors in mind, but it's worth thinking about how we communicate some of the things that are going on in the wider world to our children so they can start to make sense of it rather than feeling really worried or frightened. 
So I think now I'll just move on and think about how we can understand anxiety in our children makes makes parents feel how we can understand our own anxiety and it's in your nature as a parent to protect your children it is your instinct is to kind of if you notice danger or you feel like there might be a danger you kind of want to help and protect your child and, and, and make sure that they're safe and I think you know often if we think our, our children seem vulnerable, we're kind of on the lookout for signs of danger. We might be more on the lookout than they are. And sometimes we kind of step in or intervene rather than wait to find out if, if there's something wrong. And of course that can be really appropriate depending on you know, what the risk is. Um, if for example, you know, we're out walking in the street and our child went to step into the road, of course we would just grab them and pull them back immediately of that danger. And that's a really good example of your own fight or flight response as a parent probably kicking in and just you act without thinking you protect your child from the danger. But maybe there are situations where it's a bit more complicated or it's a bit more nuanced. Um, your child might be feeling really, someone said anxious about going to sleepovers. And so you might say, OK, don't go to any sleepovers or your child might a parent might say, um, oh, does your does your daughter want to come over for a sleepover? And you don't even tell your son or daughter because you just think, no, they're just going to worry about it. I don't want to to panic them. Then maybe we're protecting them from the worry in the short term, but we're not giving them the opportunity to develop those kind of coping skills and to learn you know, how that they can manage with their own anxiety and also how they can kind of reassess the sense of that threat of that situation by learning they can cope with with you know going to the sleepover or going to school so sometimes as parents one of the most helpful things we can do is to kind of think about our own responses to our child's anxiety and think about opportunities where we might want to to step in but actually we can ask ourselves do I need to step in in that situation or or can I help my child to explore how they can cope in that moment by by demonstrating my own kind of coping skills so it's just I think worth thinking about how we can be aware of our own anxious responses to our children's anxiety which is completely normal that we would feel that way and then we can think about how our child might be perceiving that okay I'm going to hand back to Ellis now and then I will join you all later on in the webinar thanks Gemma Okay, so something that we wanted to think about that Gemma sort of just touched on are the things that tend to keep anxiety going in our children, but I guess also in ourselves as well. These, these things also apply to our own anxieties. So we're going to sort of split this into two different areas where we think a little bit about the things that children do to look after themselves and to protect themselves when they do feel anxious. Um, and we're going to also think about the things that other people do to try and help and protect um, children when they're worried and it's worth sort of noting before we go into it any further that especially when we think about the things that other people do such as parents um, that keep anxiety going these things are done out of love and care and wanting to alleviate distress um, they're not doing it to reinforce the feelings of anxiety they're things that we all get caught doing um, and it's always from a good place but trying to be mindful of what we're doing and, and how sometimes that can actually keep the anxiety going can be a really helpful way to start to address some of the anxiety and worry that our children feel. So what we're going to look at first is things that other people do to try and help and protect children when they're anxious. Um, and so as parents, if we see that our young person's anxious, we might demonstrate anxious behavior ourselves or react in an anxious way. Um, it's very, it can be very distressing to see our children feeling so worried, especially when that worry can, can show us frustration or anger. Um, and so we might respond in a way that, that shows anxiety ourselves. Um, sometimes as parents, we can preempt situations where our children may feel anxious, even if they're not showing the signs like Gemma mentioned earlier. So we might, you know, even though our young person is, is seeming okay, we might ask questions like, oh, what if... What if you go on that school trip and you can't get to sleep? Um, because we feel like we're trying to prepare them for the eventualities that might come up. Um, but actually by doing that, we're almost sort of presenting that situation as being something that they should be worried about. Um, we can become really involved and protective and sometimes maybe a little bit too much. 
So for example, again, if your child's going on a school trip, uh, some parents might get pulled into going on the trip themselves and being a chaperone. So they've sort of got that uh, proximity there so they can help their child to feel like they're, they're a bit more protected. Um, we might also offer reassurance. Um, so it's a reassurance is a really quick way of trying to alleviate some of that distress that our children feel when they're worried. Um, but actually, we know that reassurance can be quite a difficult thing in, in trying to reduce anxiety in the long term. Um, if we do it too much, then our children tend to look for reassurance as their default way of, of coping with anxiety. So if they have worries in the future, they might always come back to you and say, well, what if this happens? And they're looking for that response to say, you'll be OK, it's safe, um, which sort of actually prevents our young people at times from being able to assure themselves um, and to sort of feel more confident in their own ability to cope. And parents can often as well sometimes get caught into uh, avoiding encouraging our young people to do things or to try new things uh, through fear that sort of that anxiety will come up again. So like Gemma said before, uh, with one of the Slido comments that was made about your child being worried about trying new things, we know that the uncertainty can be uh, really tricky. And even as adults, we find uncertainty tricky. Uh, something that I think we've definitely seen over the last couple of years with, with how our lives have, have changed really with different events that have come up. Um, and actually sort of not encouraging or, or Bigging up how brave our children can be to try and empower them to do these difficult things um, can mean that they sort of get in, caught in a cycle of just not doing them or avoiding them in order to uh, feel that relief and to sort of get away from those uncomfortable feelings of anxiety. Um, so these things that, that other people do, it's not just parents. We know that uh, teachers, for example, or other family members or siblings or even friends can get caught in these ways of responding to children that are worried. Um, so it can be lots of people within your children's system that may be reacting in a way that is trying to help um, and trying to sort of alleviate some of that worry and distress, but actually can keep that anxiety going in the long term because our children don't learn that they can cope or learn the skills to be able to cope on their own, which is really important for when they sort of grow into adolescence and into adulthood as well. Something that you might find helpful um, as a parent is trying to keep a journal of your own responses for when your young person is anxious. So if your child has a worry, how are you responding? And just noticing how we respond to worry in our children can be a really helpful first step um, of trying to think of different ways and maybe more helpful ways of, of responding and supporting our children when they feel worried. The other section that we wanted to cover was things that we might notice that our child does when they're feeling worried. And we've touched on these a little bit. So the first one uh, on that list there is anxious thinking. So when we feel worried, we can have a bit of a bias to look at evidence that fits in with our worries, um, rather than looking at the evidence that, that might go against them. Uh, so for example, um, if your young person is worried about going on a school trip and maybe being able to go to sleep if it's an overnight or residential trip maybe they'll think about all the times they couldn't sleep at home or they had nightmares um, rather than thinking of the times actually they they fell asleep fine um, so our children can often have a bit of a spotlight on evidence that that aligns with their worries um, and it can be helpful sometimes for us to encourage or ask questions that help our children to see the other side from a different perspective to try and create a little bit of a balance. Uh, we don't want to just be positive for positivity's sake, but trying to create a balance in thinking uh, can be really helpful. Um, our children may also have thoughts that overestimate the danger um, and also underestimate their ability to cope. And this is sort of the equation of anxiety where we uh, have our perception of how dangerous a situation is and we compare that to how well we think we can cope in that situation. And if the danger feels really high and our ability to cope feels really low, then actually that's where worry seeps in and it feels like we won't be able to manage and it feels like it's going to be a really difficult situation to be in. So we can you know, encourage our children to have a different perspective at times and the danger that's there 
um, or by encouraging them to be brave and to face anxious situations in a slow and gradual way that we'll come on to a bit later, we can start to develop some of that confidence um, in our children and their ability to cope, which sort of tries to help um, avoid that underestimation of, of their coping ability. Our children can often also misinterpret the physical symptoms of anxiety. So while we know that um, an elevated heart rate or quicker breathing is a really common response to anxiety, it's trying to keep us safe, it's trying to get our body ready to fight or to run away from a danger. Um, our children often don't understand that that's a really normal way of anxiety showing up. Um, and instead it can be really easily misappraised or misinterpreted as something bad's happening, something's really wrong with me. You know, if we didn't know sort of about how we feel and we're worried and all of a sudden our heart started beating really quickly, I'd imagine a lot of us would start worrying, oh man, why is my heart beating so quick? Is it a heart attack? Is there, am I ill? Um, what's going on? And if we don't understand it, that can be really difficult to tolerate as well. So we might sort of have those feelings of, you know, I can't bear, can't bear these physical feelings that are going on. Um, and then we also see a lot of anxious behavior as well in our young people when they're feeling worried. So this can be through avoidance. So not engaging in situations where they feel worried, um, actively avoiding them as, as it suggests. So for instance, if you've got a child who's really afraid of, of a specific teacher, um, not going to those lessons or not going to school on the day that they have that lesson is a, it's sort of a really common sort of example of avoidance, um, not being in the situation that makes them worried. And while in the short term, this gives that relief because they don't have to be in that anxious situation. In the long term, they uh, never get a chance to test those beliefs about how dangerous it is. So that overestimation of danger carries on. And they also never get a chance to see that they can manage in that situation. So that underestimation of coping carries on as well. So we keep having that discrepancy. Um, we also see safety behaviors like Gemma mentioned earlier. So this might be always having to do something with someone else or if our child is trying new things like a water slide, having someone else need to go down at first to make sure that it's safe to do. Um, and these are behaviors that, as the name would suggest, help our young people and children to feel safe um, and to sort of try and reduce some of that anxiety very similar to avoidance, it, it sort of prevents our young people and children from learning that they can manage in that situation or to be able to tolerate some of the uncertainty of doing something new that we're going to experience throughout our lives. Even as adults, we have lots of uncertainty that crops up as well. Um, and the last behavior we've got on that list is to seek reassurance from others. So as I said earlier, our children may come to us to say, is everything going to be okay? What happens if I do this? Um, a common one is young people being worried about uh, eating certain foods or being poisoned. So they'd ask for that reassurance, you know, if I eat this, will it poison me? Um, and sort of by engaging in that, we're sort of encouraging them almost to have to come back to us to check again and again for different sorts of food. Um, so we want to try and encourage perhaps more self-assurance, which we'll come on to a little bit later. So before I hand over to Gemma for the next section, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the three areas of things that you might notice our child doing link back to those three areas that Gemma was speaking about earlier on in the, in the webinar, where we have the thinking, we have the physical feelings or the emotions, and we have the behaviors that are associated with anxiety. Um, and it's really helpful to, to know each of these areas um, because that's how we essentially pick the strategies that might be most helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Gemma for the next section. Thanks, Ellis. So really just immediately kind of following on from what Ellis uh, was talking about there, we want to kind of offer the opportunity to kind of set a bit of a, a, a task for you guys or an exercise that might be helpful. Um, and we want to think of you kind of being almost anxiety detectives over the next couple of weeks in between this part one and this part two. So just as we've already started doing together in the webinar all the way through, we want you to start to think about noticing what your child does when they are anxious. And as Ellis said, if we notice what's happening when your child is feeling anxious or, or what you know, they might be feeling or, or what some of the physical sensations they're having might be, then we can really start to think about 
matching up what you could do as parents to help them manage that anxiety. So it's about kind of understanding what's going on and then thinking, well, how would the most helpful way of, of responding, what would that be? What might that look like? So before we kind of get to that in the part two, we want to kind of think about how you could start to be really curious um, about your um, child's experience of when they're feeling anxious. And we'll send out this um, table for you in our resources pack that we'll send at the end of the webinar. But sometimes it can be really helpful to keep a kind of written record um, and, to, and to really break the, 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 uh, the episode of kind of feeling anxious down into the situation, the thoughts, the feelings and the behaviours. So if your child starts feeling really anxious, you might think, what was happening at the time? Like, what was the situation? What were we doing? Was it first thing in the morning and you're trying to get out the door and go somewhere um, new for the day that they haven't been before? Are they going to try a new hobby or activity over the summer? Or is it bedtime and it's last thing and you've done the bedtime routine and it's like 10 o'clock at night and they're not settling or they're feeling really worried so try and be really specific about what's the situation, what's going on. And then thinking about, you know, what might they be thinking? What are some of their anxious thoughts? Maybe they're telling you and they're saying, I'm really worried about this. Or what if this happens? Um, or what's going to happen tomorrow? They're asking lots of questions to try and get that sort of reassurance. They might, and it's really common for children either not to know what their anxious thoughts are or not to be able to tell you when they are feeling really anxious. But as a parent, you know, you might have a pretty good guess about what they might be thinking or what they might be worried about. And sometimes it can be just as helpful to record kind of what your hypothesis is and what they might be thinking, um, because then you can always check back and, and ask them later when they're maybe feeling a bit less anxious and, and see if your kind of instincts, you know, were right. Uh, and, and that might give you some clues for later on as well. Um, Again, thinking about the feelings, what were they feeling in their body at the time? Um, and also emotionally, what were they feeling? It might be that they're feeling really frustrated or really angry. It might be that they're feeling really scared because they're having these physical symptoms, like Ella said, and they're a bit worried about what they might mean. Um, or it might be that also that's what they tell you. They might not say, I'm really worried, or, or they might come up to you and say that, you know, they're not feeling very well or they're feeling a bit sick just before you go out to try that new summer activity. So um, it's worth just kind of recording that as well and then finally thinking about their behaviors are they kind of avoiding anything is it bedtime and you know that they've had a drink and you know they've cleaned their teeth and you know they've gone to the loo but they're kind of wanting to redo all of those things again to kind of put off the moment of going to bed um, so thinking about what are they what are their behaviors or are they asking you to do lots of things? Are they wanting lots of um, reassurance? Are they asking you lots of questions? So you might want to kind of keep a track of that. And once we kind of have this information, once we've kind of gathered some of this evidence, it'd be really helpful if you bring this along to the next webinar. So then we can start to think about as parents, you know, what might you be able to do that would be helpful to kind of manage some of these different um, kind of signs of anxiety. One of the things um, that I think it's really helpful to offer some ideas on are just how you might start to, to use some helpful questions to help explore your child's anxiety. I think talking about anxiety can be really challenging. Um, and so sometimes it's helpful as a parent to have a few questions in mind that you can kind of try out to maybe either start the conversation or kind of be a bit more specific about what you want to find out. So we've got some questions on the slide here. Um, so sometimes you can just ask, you know, why are you feeling worried? What, you know, what's the situation? That could be a really hard question for some people because they might feel like, I don't know why I'm feeling worried. I'm just worried that something bad might happen. And that's something I hear really commonly from young people I work with. They don't know exactly why they're worried, but just like their fight or flight response is telling them, they're just a bit worried that something bad might happen. So they're kind of, a bit in that precautionary sense, kind of feeling worried in case. Um, but some people can, can really articulate why they might say I'm worried because, you know, I've got to go to a sleepover and it's really clear there's a specific event that they're feeling worried about. You might want to ask them, how does it feel to be so worried? What do you feel in your body? What's changing in your body when you're feeling worried or, or what emotions are you feeling? And they might say, oh, I'm feeling really angry. I'm feeling really annoyed. I don't like these 
uncomfortable feelings in my body or these annoying worries in my in my thoughts or they might say you know I feel really sad I feel really scared so it can be really helpful to ask them how they feel as well sometimes you can ask you know what do you think will happen if you you know do whatever the thing is that they might be worried about so if you go on that sleepover if you try that new sports club if you go into school what do you think will happen if you do it um, and often that kind of links with the next question, you know, what's the worst thing that might happen? Because, you know, in your mind, you might be planning to kind of, I think someone said family get together. So you might be thinking, oh, it's lovely. We're going to have a, a family barbecue on the weekend. Um, but your child is thinking, what's the worst thing that might happen? Oh, I might uh, not like any of the food or I might feel really awkward or I might be worried no one's going to talk to me. So they might have all of these worries that as a parent, you're kind of thinking really differently about the situation. So sometimes asking what's the worst thing that might happen can be really helpful for someone to think about, you know, to understand what their fears are about that situation. And sometimes it can help to be really specific. So you might ask a question like, what is it about the situation that's making you feel worried or frightened? Because sometimes, it, you know, again, it might be if we use the sleepover example someone shared, um, you know, the situation is the sleepover, but they might just be really worried about the bedtime like they might be really looking forward to like watching a movie with their friends or having a snack or going out or doing something but then they're just really worried about that bit when it like comes to bedtime or they might be worried about you their parents when they're not with you so sometimes asking what is it about the situation that makes you feel worried can be helpful to be really specific and to help you to understand what it is your child's worried about as i said at the beginning of that slide I just think it's really important that you kind of pick your moment with, with some of those questions as well. Don't feel too pressured to have that conversation all at once. And, um, and sometimes if your child's really, really anxious in the moment, although you may have all those questions, you may want to just kind of wait until they are feeling calmer and then they can engage their kind of upstairs thinking brain, as Ellis said, and, and you can kind of ask some of those questions. But just be, be curious about understanding their perspective. And then this will take us really nicely into next week where we can start to think about strategies. So the next time we meet, we'll, we're going to think about containment, how you can kind of help contain your child's feelings when they're feeling really anxious. What you can do to kind of notice your own anxiety. We're going to think about learning by doing. So how we can create those kind of positive coping experiences for your child. We're going to think about problem solving and also worry time distraction and how we can use relaxation to help calm some of those anxious feelings. Okay, so we're at the end of the part one session. So we, we make all of our um, content and our webinars based on kind of parents' feedback. So we'd just like to know if you found the session helpful or not helpful or somewhere in the middle. Any feedback you give us can be really helpful um, to help us think about how our content is helping parents and if we need to change it. So if you don't mind, it would be great if you could um, fill in the slide in. Thanks to those of you already doing so. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Brilliant. Sounds like people have found, found the session helpful, which, which is really good to know. We hope there's been some useful information that can help you start thinking about your child's anxiety. Okay, just we've covered a lot, you know, in this first session. So sometimes it's really helpful just to think about what are two things that you might take away from the session. Um, there's been loads of information, but it's really important that you just take the things that feel helpful and useful to you. So some of the things we might have covered, like, you know, breaking anxiety down, the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviours, um, or maybe understanding your own response to your child's anxiety, or just learning where anxiety comes from. Um, or, or thinking about, you know, what you might notice in your child. Um, can, yeah, just some ideas of things that we've talked about. So we've got someone saying, thinking about my own reaction when my child is anxious. Yeah, I think that's brilliant to kind of take that away. Just noticing how you yourself feel, because of course, when your child's anxious, that's going to have an emotional impact on you. And that's completely normal and natural. Um, someone saying, noticing thoughts and feelings. Yeah, it's like noticing uh, the different components of anxiety can really help you to understand your child's experience. But the brain house thing, so 
and asking about thoughts. Yeah, I think the brain house is a really good one to keep coming back to. Um, and it's always going to be online available on the psychology and schools teams first webinar as well if you need to kind of have a, a refresh but thinking about you know are we are we is it the feelers talking or is it the thinkers and how can we connect the two um someone saying being aware of how i speak to my anxious child knowing what's unhelpful for anxiety yeah just our own comments can make a big difference what questions to ask to talk about anxiety yeah brilliant some conversation kind of starters there Someone else saying they want to think about identifying situations that cause their child's anxiety and the thoughts around that. I think that's brilliant. Definitely use the table. It'd be really interesting to hear what you kind of come back with next time. Someone saying just knowing anxiety is normal and what keeps it going. And I think that's brilliant. Anxiety is a really normal emotion. We can all feel it and experience it at times, but also thinking about what's keeping that cycle going watching reactions and thinking I'm helping by avoiding situations that's brilliant that someone's picked up on that sometimes just maybe we're not creating those opportunities for really good reasons because we're trying to be really protective um but sometimes we can think about how that might be impacting our child's anxiety um and someone saying just being reminded of other things from the webinar yeah I think that's a really good point there's so much to remember there's so much information out there but just take the things that feel helpful to you um, and kind of leave the things that don't and, and we'll pick it up next time and um, with some more strategies and kind of ideas. So I just want to kind of finish off by talking about the resources and the signposting. So as we've said throughout, this is a two part webinar course. So the next time we meet, we will introduce some strategies you can use to help manage your child's anxiety. We've mentioned a couple of resources all the way throughout. So things like the uh, table with how you can keep a track of your child's anxiety. We'll email that out to you so you can start to use that as a record to implement some of the um, things that we have talked about and I think that covers us for today so we'll look forward to seeing everybody next time on the part two of the under 12s um, parenting webinar. Lovely. Thank you very much.